Margot and I got the script and we were sitting on the couch and I'll never forget and we were reading it and laughing and crying and every six pages turning around going, that's never gonna happen. Oh my God, how are we yeah. gonna do this? It was a long process with Mattel and Warner Brothers to get the movie made, but it was ultimately they trusted in the process and they trusted in Greta's vision. And I think as a producer, the, the main thing we can do is trust our filmmakers. Welcome to Off Script with The Hollywood Reporter. I'm Yvonne Orji and we are here again at the beautiful Georgian, a historic hotel in Santa Monica, California. And for years, The Hollywood Reporter has been bringing industry icons together for insightful conversations about their lives and work. And when it comes to iconic Hollywood films, guys, you know the stars, you know the directors, even the stunt doubles, but do you really know who makes movie magic happen? Hmm? No, not the Ozempic doctors, it's the producers. Guys, you are about to meet the talented producers behind six of this year's award contending films. They are Tom Ackerley of Barbie, Christine Vachon of Past Lives, Natalie Portman of May December, Ed Gagne of Poor Things, Scott Sanders of The Color Purple, and George C. Wolfe of Rustin. They are technically on the record, but maybe just a little off script with The Hollywood Reporter. They're all yours, Mia. Thanks, Yvonne. And welcome to The Hollywood Reporter Producers Roundtable. I wanted to open up a question for all of you. What's the best piece of advice you received from a fellow filmmaker about starting out or enduring in this industry as a producer? You know, trusting your gut, trusting your instincts um, about something, whether it's a piece of material or a person or a filmmaker. Um, I, I know that when I haven't and when I've done things that I think might make sense for kind of market reasons or because they feel smart and I'm not that connected to them, it's always ended in tears. So, so that's, that's the bit of advice that I try and remember all the time. The best piece of advice was when you get involved in a project, make sure there's a piece inside of you that deeply, deeply loves it. Because at one point, it will become hell. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what you grab onto to push you through when it becomes difficult or challenging. This deep love for a project. When you're living with it for so long. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Definitely. Tom, what about you? We've been so lucky. We've been mentored by so many of our kind of idols in the producing space. And I remember Dee Dee Gardner said to me really early on, taste is the only currency you can trade in. And it really helped us focus of not making, it's kind of the same, you know, not making a decision for strategy or a financial reason. It's just make the movie because you think that movie is going to be the best movie it can be. And it really helped focus us. Christine, what I? I didn't know many producers when I, and I don't think I knew any when I started out. So this is kind of advice I've, I have given myself yeah. over the years, <laughs> which is really at the end of the day, a crisis is only when somebody gets hurt. Right. Everything else yeah. is just yeah. like, yeah. you know, a pain in the ass, mm -hmm. a challenge, a problem. But a crisis, that's the only reason to ever use that word. Totally agree. It's a marathon, it's not a sprint. Right. And what George said, I so relate to, which is you have to care about the story. You have to care about the characters and the protagonists and their journey, quite frankly, because it's a long slog. And so you need to be in it every day and you're putting out little fires every day. There's not a day, I think, that goes by that your day goes exactly as it was planned when you woke up that morning. Even if it's 3 a.m. when someone calls you and says, such and such just happens. So be prepared, be nimble, and know it's not a no. It's not a sprint. Yeah, Natalie, what about for you? Um, I think just working with people you love and and staying a team, like that when shit goes down, which it does inevitably, <laughs> that you stay together, problem solving together. Yeah. What I'm getting from all of these is so much of producing is about tenacity and staying power and just sticking with it. And Scott, you've been with The Color Purple for so long, for a number of 25 years. 25 years. Yes. <laughs> what was the biggest challenge in bringing the book to stage as a musical and then bringing the musical to the movie screen? You know, were, were there some jumps that had to be happening? Did some people need convincing? Oh my God, a lot of people needed convincing. I mean, The Color Purple doesn't, on its surface, seem like a story you'd want to sing and dance to on Broadway. And when you think about the cost of a Broadway ticket, 
that becomes even more challenging. And so the year that The Color Purple opened on Broadway, the African-American audience attendance was 3.8% of all audiences combined. So I had lots of people, George knows this, there were a lot of people that said, this show will never sell. There's no audience for it. Who's coming to see it? And I just believed in Seeley. I mean, to me, she was the most remarkable triumph over adversity story I'd ever read, ever in fiction or nonfiction. And what you said earlier, which is just have your dream, have your vision, have your own instinct, trust your gut, keep going, don't listen to no's. And I mean, every once in a while, a no is helpful, but very, <laughs> o- but very often it's based on fear or lack of knowledge or they don't understand what you're going for. And you have to just, you know, sometimes it's very lonely. I mean, we, it's, you can be, it can be a very lonely profession. But don't you think in some ways the worst thing is a soft no? Oh, yeah. (laughs) Long, long, long. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. A fast yes, a slow yes, a fast no. (laughs) In that order. Yeah, Yeah. 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 yes, exactly, exactly. Was Alice Walker, when you approached her about doing the possibility of a musical, was she she a fast yes? No, she was a fast no. Got it, oh, wow. Yeah, I went to Berkeley to see her and asked her, and she said, you seem like a very nice, smart guy, but no. And then I, and then whoever said tenacity a minute ago, um, I went home and waited a couple months and called her and I said, could I fly you to New York and let's spend a week and talk about why I think it's right to do it. Yeah. And she said yes to that, which was, that was the crack in the window. And then by the end of that week, she said, okay, you can do it, I trust you. Yeah. Um, and, and that began the journey, really. Yeah, you just need that one little yes to but it's, something. You know, but it's, yeah, it's a long journey. journey. Yeah. Yeah. Natalie, ahead of Can, I was interviewing Todd Haynes, and he told me that you and your producing team were the ones that reached out to him with the script for May, December to possibly direct the movie in the beginning. Why was Todd the right filmmaker for you? And with a script as idiosyncratic as May, December, what were you looking for in a director? Jessica Elbaum sent me the script and I read it and um, I've been wanting to work with Todd for a long time. Christine knows I've been sending you both scripts for years (laughs) and then they've said no to me and um, I guess I'm a glutton for rejection. (laughs) Were they fast? (laughs) They were fast and kind but fast Um, and when I read the script I, I saw that it dealt with so many of the questions about performance and identity that I think Todd has explored in so many of the movies I love that he and Christina made together like Safe and Far From Heaven and um I'm not there, like the, very much these questions of how we construct ourselves from various aspects of performance. And um, and I thought he might take to it and he did. And it was the best uh, luck of my life. Yeah. yeah. It was, a, it was that yes that yes. you've been waiting for. That, yes, yes. Tom and Ed, I loved watching Barbie and Poor Things almost as in conversation with one another. <laughs> uh, they are similar in, in certain ways, but for producing specifically, they're incredibly intricate in terms of set pieces, costume sequences, characters. When you all read that script for the first time, is there anything particularly outrageous that you thought to yourself like, Oh man, there's no way we can get this one done. A thousand things, yes. <laughs> yeah, and how ultimately did you get it done? <laughs> I mean, it started with a Mattel executive being shot, so that uh, yeah. that went well. <laughs> <laughs> and fascism and gynecology and and all yeah. sorts. And uh, no, I remember well. We Margot and I got the script, and we were sitting on the couch, and I'll never forget. And we were reading it and laughing and crying, and every six pages, turning around, going, "That's never going to happen." Oh my God, how are we yeah. going to do this? And it was a long process with Mattel and Warner Brothers to get the movie made, but it was ultimately they trusted in the process and they trusted in Greta's vision. And I think as a producer, the, the main thing we can do is trust our filmmaker and trust wholeheartedly what Greta was going to do with that movie. And and we managed to, you know, convince our larger partners of that and, and move forward. Yeah. Was there any one set piece that you were so excited to see on screen that you were able to get? I mean, the whole, the whole movie. I think the best, one of like the core memories was walking in to the cul-de-sac. On the, we shot there for the first day and seeing the scale of those sets and the 
dream houses were four stories high <laughs> and the whole cul-de-sac was built and the palm trees and the painted sites. It was all painted. There was no green screen. And you could see from corner to corner on this huge soundstage because the dream houses didn't have walls mm -hmm. and seeing all the Barbies and the Kens and all the costumes, just having that moment of, wow, we, we made it, um, was such like a, a moment of relief as well. It was a moment of relaxation. It was great. Yeah. And Ed, what about for you? We had done The Lobster with Yorgos, mm -hmm. and I think he read the book you know, almost 10 years ago. And soon after, we were just talking about things, and he said, you know, you should read this this book, and, and I did. And I was like, okay, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Challenging. Um, you know, it was it was something that we kind of said we'd do, mm -hmm. but we knew that it would take a while to, to kind of build it, to kind of make the case for it. And it was, you know, two movies later, we did Sacred Deer and then and then The Favourite. And it was really the fact that The Favourite sort of was a hit and that Emma Stone joined Poor Things after working with Yorgos on The Favourite. That was the thing that kind of unlocked it. And of course, Tony wrote this amazing, Tony McNamara wrote this amazing script. George, you and your film were recreating the March on Washington, which is just one of the most iconic mm -hmm. moments of 20th century American history. How do you even go about about doing that? Well, you try to do it three times. Yeah. <laughs> we, someone came up with this brilliant idea that we should film it first. Oh, the like, should, very beginning. At of the very the beginning, before shoot. we filmed anything else. And 25 to 30 trucks took off from Pittsburgh. COVID set in. We had to cancel. Oh, no. Then we start the permit process all over again, April. So after we finished the rest of the film, yeah. 25, 30 trucks again, COVID again. Oh, man. The next time that is available is August. Oh my God. By that time, I had edited the whole film together, <laughs> so I knew exactly what I needed. But also when we went there, it was in August, the march was in August in 1963. It was 83 degrees. For us, it was 117 degrees. No. And at the Lincoln Memorial, when the sun would bounce off the marble, there was nowhere for it to go other than into the actors' bodies. And there was this logistics of 500 extras and the tent where they were stored and the heat and the wool suits, because that's what they would have been in, all of these incredible details. But it turned out to be when it should have been filmed. It was complicated and a mess, but an incredible blessing in the long run because we were just now this flawless, perfect team who were ready to take on the monster as opposed to using the monster to train us how to be a team. It was third time we figured it out and it was glorious and it was wonderful and it was horrifying because of the heat, but it was glorious. Christine, one thing I hear in my reporting when it comes to filmmakers is uh, a desire for tested filmmakers mm -hmm. from studios who may be risk averse. You have such a history of producing films from first time directors like Celine Song, right. like Past Lives. How do you convince studios, financiers, fellow producers to take that chance on a first time filmmaker? And do those filmmakers need a different type of producing from you? It's not easy because especially as our world becomes more risk averse, which it is, betting on a first-time director becomes trickier and trickier to get people to do. For me, the reason why Killer keeps doing it, um, first of all, it's like, it's like the anti-cynicism. And I feel like cynicism is like the, the creativity killer. It's just, it's the thing that, it destroys everything, I think. Yeah. And when you work with a first-time director, you can't be cynical mm -hmm. because they're usually telling the story that they've waited their whole lives to tell. Yeah. And specifically to somebody like Celine, you know, she is such an extraordinary storyteller and I couldn't teach her that. I could teach her how to read a call sheet, which we did, you know, but that's easy. That's like, look at the top, look at your name. There's that, yeah. That's when you gotta be there. You know, how, you, now you know how to read a call sheet. But she knew the story she wanted to tell. And all we had to do uh, you know, our company and David Hinojosa's company was really just fill in around her with the people that were the best possible partners and really just support her. Because as I said, she knew the story she wanted to tell and that's the one thing I wouldn't really have been able to step in and do. You all have had collaborators that you've worked with time and again. When you find a creative collaborator that could be lifelong, 
How do you know? Is it like a love at first sight type of thing, lightning from the heavens, or is it a gradual process where you realize this is someone I'm going to be working with for the rest of my life? I often think that I'm more interested in people than ideas, if that makes sense, you know, so that if you kind of connect with somebody's brain that you kind of, and you, you have that kind of relationship that's based on that, then you're with, the, you're with them for the long haul. But of course, it all just starts with the first thing you do. And the filmmakers I worked with, Yorgos or Lenny Abrams or Joanna Hogg or any of those people, I don't take it for granted at any point. I know that, you know, the next time I need to do the job and do it really well. And you have to kind of keep on sort of tweaking it and trying to improve and all that kind of stuff. But of course there is great, you know, there's there's great community and friendship and it's a very important part of my life, those, those relationships and those friendships. Yeah, Tom, what about for you? I think for us, we had a really clear vision from the start and that was, you know, female films and female storytellers. And no matter how big the films get or small or whatever, we have a very clear idea of what we want to do and what we want to achieve and that won't change and hasn't changed. And it's, it's given us that ability to, to keep working and we have such, over time, created such a shorthand. Mm -hmm. And we, we all, I mean, Margot jokes that Josie's my second husband. So <laughs> it, uh, it goes, and then I think it's the same with the filmmakers, you know, we're, we're lucky to have repeat business with certain filmmakers, Emerald Fennell being one, and we did Promising Young Women and, we did a good enough job to do her second film, Saltburn, but we're lucky each time she asks us to come back and yeah, hopefully totally. she asks us yeah. again. Completely. Um, Christine, what about for you? I've been with Todd for 30 years and I've been with my uh, business partner, Pam Koffler, for um, probably also 30 years. Actually, Todd probably a few years longer. Having the partnership with Pam allows me in many ways to have the partnership with Todd mm -hmm. because it provides such a, an extraordinary amount of stability. And one of the things I'd say about those partnerships, I think it's better if you don't have the same taste. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, if you both have taste, you have to have taste, <laughs> but there's different kinds of taste. Mm -hmm. And I find that it invigorates me and wakes me up when Pam likes something and it makes me have to look at it again and say, oh, okay, I see why you do, I get it. And it, it allows us to sort of cross pollinate, yeah. you know? I mean, look, the relationships with directors, that's a whole other, almost a whole other panel. And the relationship between a producer and a director is built out of so many things, you know, trust, creative complicity, and the ability, I think, for a producer to sort of snowplow to a certain degree and help a director find the place that they can do their best work. Yeah. Well, going off of that, George, I'm actually going to throw that to you because Christine brought up such an interesting point and you pulled double duty on your project as a director and producer. For you as a I was thrilled to work with myself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Best relationship you ever had. Yeah. Uh, I am wondering though, as a director with that mindset, what do you what do you hope or what do you look for in a producerial partner? A, a sense of safety as you're venturing off the cliff, yeah. that you know what you're doing and then there's an aspect where that you don't know what you're doing and you're also looking to try to create this incredible safe place for the actors and therefore so, so that they can freely and joyfully uh, walk off the cliff and discover something that's startling and amazing and wonderful. So a sense of safety is very important and a sense of feeling protected and Natalie, like George, you're you're pulling double duty on your movie. You are acting as producer and star. So I am wondering when it comes to holding those two positions, are there times where they are in conflict with each other? And are there times where one makes one easier? Well, it's very empowering after, I mean, 30 years of being an actress to now start producing because I think there's a level where you're, when you're just acting, you're being protected and you can just focus on your art and not be aware of all the craziness that's going on. But then once you get behind the curtain, you're like, oh my God, I can't believe all this stuff has been happening. And you realize you can help make the environment that you want to work in. And it's helpful to be like, oh, there's a problem. I, I can help fix it. And I think it's similar to what all of you have been saying about kind of de-dramatizing I think that's where the conflict can come in because mm -hmm. like you know a lot of shit and like the rest of the actors don't need to know you go back to the set and you're like know that mm -hmm. and I, you both worked with actresses who mm -hmm. uh, were producing also so you're aware of all this stuff and you really 
can't share that. Like you really need to go back and make everyone feel like everything is just smooth and fine. Scott, I wanted to ask specifically about casting for The Color Purple because you could draw on multiple casts that have performed on the Broadway musical, not to mention, you know, casting a newcomer or someone, you know, outside of, of that Broadway community. What was it that made you decide to bring Fantasia back to the role? Well, obviously, it's a team sport and Blitz Bazawale, our director, we had a very early conversation about the why we were making this movie. And we were very clear that we were not remaking Steven's classic film. We were reimagining with a, with a new point of view. And we were in the conceit that our screenwriter, Marcus Gardley, uh, gifted all of us was, we're gonna go inside Seeley's imagination for the first time. We're gonna see what a protagonist that is struggling, particularly in the first two acts of the movie, what is going on with her. And so that by the time we get to act three, we really understand what her process has been. And so we have magical realism built into the screenplay. And so with all of that, we started to think about literally a casting philosophy. Who we, We've got these multi-generations. We wanted OGs like Lou Gossett Jr. to play Mr. We wanted a younger new generation audience, Halle Bailey to play young Nettie. We did look very much at the Broadway uh, alumni and uh, Danielle Brooks did audition. It was not a gift. It, she, she did everything she, everybody else had to do and won the day as Sophia. And then Fantasia was, you know, that, that's one of the hardest roles to cast. And there were a lot of options and a lot of conversations around it. And Seely someone you want to root for. And Fantasia Barino is someone you want to root for. And she really has the DNA of Seely inside her and her own personal story. I feel like we've been talking so much about the tenacity and the difficulty that comes with producing. Uh, and there's been a lot of ink spilt lately about uh, work-life balances. When you are on set and you're in the middle of it, is there any way that you all decompress? Is that something that is important in order to maintain your creative spirit? My husband and I got a house in Provincetown in Cape Cod and it was during COVID. So we were able to do that and work remotely, mm -hmm. but being around nature, I mean, I, I worked with our team and we cast the movie I mean, I was, I was looking at seagulls dropping clams on the beach while on the phone with an agent <laughs> arguing over a deal. So it was, it was the ability to balance those two things. You don't get to do that all the time. Christine, what about for you? You're, it's stalwart in independent film, which isn't necessarily known for a big breadth of time on set, but is there a way to find a moment for yourself? Well, I speak at a lot of colleges and institutions and about three or four years ago, that question kind of started to come. You know, people would say, how do you handle work-life balance? And the first time somebody asked me, I was like, what do you even mean? <laughs> uh, what is balance? Uh, <clears throat> I do feel like this new generation of, of people coming up through the business mm -hmm. are restructuring it in ways that sometimes I think some of, well, I count myself, not everyone is my age here, but I, where some of us are a little like, <clears throat> back in my day. <laughs> but um, but I also really kind of appreciate this sense of like, we understand we have to work hard. We understand that these things don't just like, you know, happen, you know, overnight or whatever. But we also do need to figure out a way to balance it in, in, in some ways that aren't quite so detrimental to our ability to have a life. It's, it's when you start a project, you become 100% consumed with it. But that's the joy of it. Exactly. You know? You go so deep into it and, you know, and Barbie in particular, the pressure of doing that film and standing up to a 64 year, year legacy with Barbie and the, you know, the financial investment from the studio and, and everyone's careers, you know, and, and there were a million ways we could have gotten the film wrong. But being so consumed and the joy of making the film, it was a, it was a dance party every day yeah. and it was so fun. And even, you know, on the days off, on we would, Greta had so many filmic references for Barbie and we would put on, uh, on Sunday mornings, we'd call Movie Church and we would, every Sunday through prep and through the shoot, we would get the crew together and we'd watch something at 11 a.m. on a Sunday morning. And that was a great way to, you're still involved in the film and you're still 
creating the family of the film, but managing to look at it through a different lens. Ed, you actually mentioned something that I wanted to circle back to, which is, you know, Yorgos had been wanting to make poor things for a while. What were the factors that, in your mind, had to finally come together to get this over the finish line? And do you think it could have been made in Hollywood five or even ten years ago? It's a hard question to answer. I think the times did move to kind of to create maybe an interest in the film that maybe mightn't have been there in the past. Mm -hmm. You know, we also really benefited from COVID because we knew that we had the building blocks in terms of turning script and uh, Film 4 in the UK who were developing the film with us and an interest from Searchlight. So Yorgos and Emma had a lot of time to refine their thinking around how Bella would be created, how the film would evolve. And she was a producer on the film at that point. So there was a kind of producerial element to that conversation as well around casting, around imagining it. And also we had a lot of time to kind of do the due diligence as to how we would build these sets because 90% of the film is shot on sound stages mm. in Hungary and Budapest. And actually probably it turns out that we couldn't have done it any, anywhere other than Budapest, you know, in terms of just the economics of it and the tax credit and all that kind of stuff. And we had the, the, I was just reminded of what Tom was saying earlier when he was talking about being on the Barbie sets. But we had we built the set for Lisbon in, in the Alexander Korda studio in outside Budapest, and it's the biggest sound stage in continental Europe. It was the first time also that Jorgos had ever worked on stages, mm. wow. like never shot on a set before, and and really just had never used lighting before. And Robbie Ryan, who shot it, had, you know, the favorite was all mainly natural light, so it was a kind of complete sort of opposite to that, but. I remember when we um, we f first went on the the um, Lisbon set, and I was it was kind of breathtaking. And I remember Jorgen was going around, kind of scratching his head, and he was going, and it was big. This was a big set. Jorgen was like, I don't know how I'm going to shoot all of Lisbon on this set. It's like it's it, like it's, it's how am I, how am I going to chase you know uh, Bella around this set? And it was kind of like, oh my god. I mean, it couldn't have been bigger actually. But. <laughs> Christine, you've, you've worked so heavily in independent film for so long, and I feel like the headlines heralding the, you know, the death of independent film kind of pop up every, you know, once every five years. You know, now we're still digging our way out of the pandemic, and, and the industry is in a different place, but I'm wondering, what do you say to people who decry the end of independent film. But is that what they're decrying or are they mm. decrying the end of the theatrical experience? Mm. Because to me, I mean, independent film really, you know, I think what's really gotten murky is what is an independent film. I mean, I'd say all of us here have made movies with studios that have also had an independent element. So in some ways, your question to me is about the theatrical experience, which I think we are all grappling with, I would say, mm -hmm. you know, um, I, not to speak for all of you, but I know I'm grappling with it and, and trying to figure out what makes something theatrical, how important is it to sustain that experience, mm -hmm. and what do we have to do as producers to keep it relevant? What do you have to do as producers to keep it relevant? You know, when I first started out, uh, it was all, you know, theatrical was all there was available to us, so we didn't have to think about it that much. It's like, you made a movie, that's what happened to it. And then over the years, it's gotten sort of parsed, and I know you do TV as well, so we find ourselves really like, what makes it theatrical? What makes it television? How do you figure out that like precise storytelling path? Mm. And that's been a lot more for the lack of a better word, work, but it's not really work. It's more about training a different instinct mm -hmm. for me, mm -hmm. you know, that I didn't maybe have at the beginning of my career. Speaking of the theatrical experience, I feel like this year, theatricality is synonymous with Barbie. Like, I think that, yeah, you can't, you can't get away from it. I'm wondering, Tom, at what point did you, did you and the team realize, like, oh, this, this could be bigger than maybe even we anticipated? I don't think you ever know until you see it. You know, I think. And even then. And even then, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we're still trying to work it out. No. Yeah. Um, yeah, and you you know, we, you can't, ca you, don't, you can never recreate something and it, you are catching lightning in a bottle and it became a cultural event. And, you know, that first weekend it opened, we were in London, Margot, myself and David and Greta was, and Noah were in New York and we were going cinema to cinema and you saw the lines 
And I remember, like, I always remember not know that Spielberg Scorsese story when Jaws came out. Oh, yeah. Like, they go drive around the block and they saw the lines. And I didn't think that could exist anymore. Mm. And we saw it. And we saw the lines of pink. And we saw how people of different socio backgrounds and shapes and sizes and colors and religions came together and shared that experience. And it was just, like, mind opening it was incredible and it shows you know however hard a movie is or however long a movie takes to bring people together for that two hours is something that you can mm. uh, it gives you goosebumps it's incredible and i'm sort of hopeful that the kind of tectonic plates are shifting a little bit when you see barbie which is, is its own own new thing and oppenheimer and you know the movies that we're all talking about here today that there's a kind of boldness in the storytelling and even you know you think of celine's film which is delightful but absolutely theatrical like that is a film you want to fall into like it's delicate and it's character driven but it's absolutely theatrical and I, I I sort of hope that kind of as peak tv wanes and people are moving maybe a bit more to the mainstream in television that actually movies are going to get bolder and you know maybe not so reliant on the kind of old ip that's been around for the last five or ten years and that maybe things that are more creator driven, more filmmaker driven are are going to be more appealing because the, the old way was, you know, you go to the cinema every Friday and then you go, what movie am I going to see? Yeah. Now you go, what movie am I, am I going to see? And then you decide whether you're going to go to the theater yeah. or not or indeed watch it on the streamers. I hope we're going to move into a phase of kind of bigger storytelling for the cinema, more spectacular, bigger swings, edgier stuff, you know, I hope. Yeah, we had so many people say that was the first time they've been back since COVID. It was the first time I been to cinema with my mum was a, lot, a big one and, and to your point the amount of cinema owners that would reach out and say you saved our business yeah. like we we had we were on shutting down yeah, totally. and it saved the business it was amazing well george and i started our careers in the theater and we've yeah. known that magic of a communal experience there's nothing like it there's just nothing like it and the same thing happens in cinema i mean watching your movie with all those people in costume and all ages and it was it, it it's a remarkable thing when when that happens and you get that shared experience and the potency of the scale <clears throat> yes 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 my analogy is said that when you're in the theater and a play is working you lean forward mm -hmm. when you're watching a movie and the film is working you lean backwards mm -hmm. because True. of the scale you, you because of the scale of the event and it's both of those dynamics yeah. Yeah. that are very different but extraordinary yeah you're taking it all in you're, in both ways yeah you take your you because you see the, in theater, they're the same size as you. Yeah. So you go, oh, I recognize what yeah. that is. And then in film, you're going, they're bigger than me. Yeah. And can I find my way inside of their story? Yeah. And so it's that dynamic that I think is really thrilling to, to have, have that shift happen. Yeah. What do you think you all would be doing if you weren't producers and, and filmmakers? What does the producerial capacity lend to uh, other professions? <laughs> I'd be a historian. I'd be a short order cook. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say restaurateur. Because it's got a lot oh, you of the see same... you have bigger visions. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you have the house in Provincetown. Yeah. Right? <laughs> no, but it's, it's, it's putting all these things together and, and then trying to please an audience. I want to hear what Natalie's would do. Oh. <laughs> well, I feel like... I, I mean, I feel like the thing that comes to my head is just being like full-time parent because I feel like it's very similar skills of just like mm -hmm. taking care of everything and making sure everyone is supported in the way they can become their best selves you know Ed what about for you well uh my mom and my dad were doctors mm -hmm. and I think I and very early on I decided I wanted to get involved in film like when I was very young and wanted to produce. Weirdly, I had this instinct around wanting to produce when mm -hmm. I was in my teens, even my late teens. Um, I think it was just a partly a reaction against what my parents were doing or what they did, and uh, partly that. But but then when I was a little older, when I was in my mid twenties, I was like, God, should I have done medicine? Should I have been a doctor? So there's part of me that still has a kind of curiosity around that. But I don't know if I would have made a very good doctor. But <laughs> Tom, what about for? I was an assistant director, so I went into film really young. Similar, my parents were in a different field and I knew I wanted to make movies and from such a young age. I grew up in the UK and the UK film 
environment is so strong. So I went that route mm. and then went into producing. So I, if I wasn't producing, I'd, I'd probably still be, you know, assistant Indeed. director. But if not, I, what I thought, I'd probably be in events of some kind, sport events or music events or something like that. Yeah. I think of the show Formula One put on and like oh, yeah. orchestrating that on a global level is incredible. It's not too late, Tom. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Next so, Side job. <laughs> <laughs> I did want to circle back, see if there were any questions that you all wanted to ask to each other. Well, I was curious about past lives. I mean, again, that was a film that we were so grateful for in, in our cinema in Dublin, because it feels like there That's is great to hear. a bit of a movie drought in a way. Like, you know, there are these things that come along and everyone wants to go and see them, but there's big gaps between them. But I thought it was so interesting that it, it kind of inhabited that kind of dual language thing as well, that it, it had that bilingual thing going on. How challenging was it to do that? When we actually read the script, of course, we clocked that some of it is in Korean and mm -hmm. the translation would be alongside. But I don't think we actually completely understood until we started shooting. Yeah. Like, a lot of this movie yeah. is not in yeah. English, yeah. a lot yeah. of it. Yeah. 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 And the sort of the, the way it's sort of very, Celine kind of very nimbly kept it moving in that kind of... In that, you know, a lot of it had to do with her direction and how she really figured out ways to put up barriers between the characters that would allow them, you know, not just through language, but through proximity, et cetera, which would really allow them to inhabit this sort of awkward, sometimes uncomfortable spaces yeah. that they were in. It's, um, it really is a dual language film. Yeah. And it, as I said, in some ways, we didn't realize that till we saw the first yeah. cut. Yeah. And we were like, oh, right, yeah. 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 <laughs> there seems to be a kind of a very welcome and creeping acceptance of, you know, non-English language cinema becoming more mainstream. In a sense, you know, I you know? and I've also read that because so many people now watch streamers with yeah. the captions on, yeah. Yeah. you know, yeah. that they're like, eh, subtitles. Yeah. You yeah. Know? It's when been it, more normalized. Yeah. yeah. Well, my final question for you all is, when you all were getting started, what was it, what was the film that made you say, I want to be a filmmaker? The Wizard of Oz. What was it nope. about it? Everything. <laughs> yeah, everything. It was bigger than anything I'd ever seen. I'd never seen the black and white going to color. We had a we had a black and white television at home, so we I didn't know it was in color until we went to the next door neighbor's house to watch it. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, the music, the the magic, the 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 the, the crazy, like you know, flying monkeys. I mean, there were there were so there's so many things in that movie that I fell in love with, and um, so yeah. Yeah. George, what about for you? There was some Disney stuff that I was obsessed with when I was little, but it was really Nashville. Mm. Uh. That, that a film could be ridiculous and political and emotionally fragile and, and performance, that, that it was a collision of all these things and, and that the storytelling was so ambitious. And if you surrendered, it was effortless. And so Nashville is, was really, really significant. And at one point, Al Altman asked me to write a movie for him. Wow. Wow. Oh, wow. wow. Well, was I, well, it was, he, me to, he was interested in doing something about Amos and Andy. And I went, I don't think I'm going to be doing it. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to, I'd love to, I'd love to, but. Yeah. He'd seen a show, a Broadway show that I did called yeah. Bringing the Noise, Bringing the Funk, and he wanted me to create something with comedy and something, and it was extraordinary conversations, but no. But I, Nashville. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Humble, humble, honored, honored, but Nashville. Yeah. <laughs> Bringing the Noise was so important to me. As <laughs> I saw it like, I, I would stand in line at tickets when I was like eight. Oh, with wow. my parents, and I went like oh, three beautiful. or four times. That's the so show I took Alice Walker to, the first show I took her to in wow. New York when we were together. And at the end of that week, she said yes, so thank you, sir. Yes, <laughs> thank you. You deserve a thank producer. You. Give me my, yeah. my, my <laughs> <laughs> so good, so good. Yeah. I think the Safe was a really, really important movie for me. I think it was... I mean, as a film and as a performance, I think I was just so blown away by how much I could recognize of experience that I didn't have words for and I didn't have words for after either. It was just a feeling. It was a tone of, of life that was 
it just made made me understand things in a, in a new, different, in mind and soul expanding way. Ed, what about for you? I think the thing that actually made me think this is possible was um, My Left Foot, Jim Sheridan's mm -hmm. movie, My Left Foot. And it was like, that was like Ireland winning the World Cup. It was like, <laughs> it, was, it was so exciting, you know, because there, there wasn't a big history of filmmaking in Ireland. Mm -hmm. And the idea that, you know, that this movie, which was intensely Irish, an Irish story and, you know, Irish filmmaker, Irish producer, the whole thing could kind of go the distance and could become the thing that it became was really exciting. And I remember vividly, vividly, you know, staying up all night to watch the Oscars. It's obviously on a different timeline to Ireland. And there was so much kind of excitement and pride around that. And I, I don't know, I think that sort of unlocked something for me where it was like, OK, maybe that's possible too, maybe that slipstream that Jim and Neil, I guess, you know, that slipstream we could fill, fall into that. Yeah, Tom, what about for you? I knew I wanted to work in the film and movies and I got onto a Harry Potter set and I got to see in my early teens and I got to see Alfonso Cuaron at work and I got to see the scale of it and the cameras and the machine behind it. And that's when I went, that's what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. And I was 12 or 13 and it was, and I still get that feeling when I walk on a set that, that it's enlightenment, it's incredible. Mm -hmm. And Christine? Well, I think I, I will talk more about, uh, and I'll be brief, about the movie that made me decide I wanted to be a producer, mm -hmm. which was the other Barbie movie, Superstar, the Karen Carpenter story, oh. which was Todd's first oh, yeah. short film. And I saw that film and I, was, I didn't produce it. Uh, I, helped, I helped him finish it. So I got to see it in the edit room. And um, I just had an epiphany because it was so provocative, it was so original, but it was entertaining. Mm. And I realized like that's the, that's the nexus, yeah. that's where <laughs> yeah. I want to be. And uh, then I just turned to Todd and said, what are you doing next? Uh, and 30 years later. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, you all, I can't thank you enough for this conversation. It's been enlightening and fun and incredible. So to finish things off here, a quick toast I drank, to you all. I drank all mine. <laughs> that's what we should be doing right now, baby. Cheers. 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 Uh, I don't know about you, but I feel like we learned so much today from the people who make movie magic happen. And now that you know what a producer actually does, I don't know. It seems pretty easy to make a billion dollars in the box office. I mean, am I right? <laughs> am I right? I'm probably wrong. But until next time, guys, I'm Yvonne Orji, and this is Offscript with The Hollywood Reporter. Bye.